The only bad thing about that crazy ending of last week's Shogun episode was that I knew what was coming next. There were a few times this season when I thought the show might change up Mariko's ending, but it never really made sense. While there were some significant changes on the path to get here, it always felt like this was where we'd end up. It was as devastating as I imagined it would be, but it made for some great TV, and for the most part, it got us back to the same place we were at at this point in the book. A couple of weeks back, I had the hardest time trying to figure out why they were emphasizing the idea of fate in episode 7. Sure, Toronaga believes it's his fate to unify Japan, but he's also Minawara. So depending on how you look at things, that's just something he was born in a particularly good position to do. He's a powerful guy from a powerful family, and with that being the case, who cares what he thinks his fate is? That's not to say he's not a good character or that that wasn't a good episode. Last week they made it plain that he's not just doing all this because he loves power. He believes what he's doing will be good for Japan. And that even though Nagakado and Hiramatsu's deaths were sacrifices he was willing to make and used to his advantage, he's affected by them, which means they come at a cost. This week I was so relieved when Ocha laid it out for the regents and by extension me. The Christians don't believe Mariko will forfeit her eternal soul by committing suicide. Ochiba, who is the only person that really knows her there, tells them that she'll absolutely do it. And she might as well have pulled out a giant modern black chisel tip marker to underline it so I could get up from my chair and applaud the screen when she says, Mariko will do it because it's her vengeance on fate. What a great way to manufacture this. Adding in their childhood relationship so it all makes sense. Scaling back the love affair so that her life isn't just the thing that Blackthorn loses. While also having something really significant exist between them as this all unfolds. We've still got another episode to go, but they're putting together something that manages to showcase what was great about the source material. While becoming its own thing, and gosh, you just wish more adaptations would come out like this. Crimson Sky was described as a quick and deadly assault on the nearly impenetrable Osaka Castle. And that is what we see play out in Episode 9, which carries the name. Only, this happens by way of an individual rather than an army. And that makes this Mariko's episode. You probably picked up on most of this from watching the first eight episodes, but I find the setup and execution of the plan so satisfying that you're just going to have to indulge me. Remember when Ochiba was in Edo visiting her sister? Officially, Tornaga would say she was free to leave because to keep the mother of the heir against her will would be an actionable crime. It seems silly in a way. If everyone knows she can't leave, then she's a hostage, right? Well, no, not exactly. Not if everyone agrees with the official story. Because if you didn't and called Tornaga a liar, then that would be something he'd have to answer for. And let's not forget that these are warlords we're talking about. It's similar to the air quotes bandits killing Sugiyama's family. Nobody believes that, but to say otherwise would be to question Ishido's honor. And he's currently in control of Osaka Castle as protector of the air and his army. There are rules and there are layers to those rules. And that's why it works so well to have Blackthorn and Yabashige be the ones to be there as this goes down. The engine, as a foreigner, barely understands the intricacies. And Yabu is so concerned with self-preservation and trying to land on the right side that he can't be expected to see things clearly. This is all Mariko, and she's been positioned as the character who could pull it off. The problem that needs solving is that Ishido and Ochiba have every important person and their families in the castle. This means they're all forced to ally with him, or at the very least can't actively fight against him. He uses the air and the Council of Regents the Tycho set up to protect him as a pretense. Tornaga's wives, who were instrumental in his escape, are caught up in this, so he can use that and his knowledge that none of the people who are being held hostage, even though they're all technically allowed to leave anytime they want, just like Ochiba was when she was in Edo, Tornaga knows that none of these people are okay with that. That's the key. Before we get into how that plays out, since it is her episode, it starts with a flashback to 14 years ago, when we see how a pregnant Mariko who's been forbidden from committing seppuku becomes a Christian. She's denied death and Alvito is there to offer faith. 
You get the sense that he could have been anyone in that moment, but his presence was enough to give her hope. He gives her the cross that we've seen her wear throughout the series and tells her it's for when she has no words and needs something to hold on to. It puts her beliefs into perspective and shows why she holds on to them even when they conflict with her culture. When she has no words is a great choice of phrase, since given her situation, they're often the only tools she has as a translator, as a poet, and as Toronaga's secret weapon. Some other things happen in the lead-up, but the heart of this episode revolves around that. Blackthorn and Yabu have a plan, and we check in with the Jesuits, but they're all wondering what Mariko is up to, or what Toranaga is up to, really. Lord Kiyama and Blackthorn have a conversation to remind you who he is, and that they still consider John's presence a threat. After Yabu's offer gets shot down, Mariko makes her entrance. This is the first time she's seen Ochiba in years, and she congratulates her on her engagement. Ochiba mentions how they used to do poetry together, and wants her to submit the first line for their upcoming competition that'll be held to honor the Taiko's wife who passed away in the last episode. She does that and then surprises everyone, saying she won't be there for the competition. Her lord has sent her there to escort his wives back to Edo, so that he can see his newest son. There's a visible reaction from everyone in attendance. Obviously, Ashido has no intention of letting that happen. And reading the room, Ochiba quickly asks her to continue the conversation in private. Of course, the reaction's what she's going for, so she declines and insists that she's leaving tomorrow. She'll return with her lord on the day he's required to be in Osaka. That is, unless they're confined there. That's followed by a great back and forth about how they aren't, but really are, and he uses the technicality of having the regents meet to discuss it, to try to delay, and she presses, saying she's been ordered by her lord and therefore bound to leave anyway. It gets good when he tries to cut her off, and she reminds him that she's no peasant to be trodden on. This is an indirect insult to his background, and she gets to follow that up by declaring that she's the daughter of the great lord Akechi Jinsai. Her line has been samurai for a thousand years and she'll never be captive or hostage or confined. She's free to leave as she pleases, as is anyone. Anasawai is amazing throughout this episode, but things start to take off from here. We've seen the history that's wrapped up in those words, even though she keeps her composure throughout to look largely unbothered. And then we have Ochiba and Blackthorn there to kind of be our stand-ins, to be feeling it while trying not to react. When she sees it hit Ashido, she allows herself about a quarter of a smirk. Then she does this turn with her robe that feels like a period on the end of that sentence before she walks out as if nothing just happened. Behind closed doors, Yabu and Blackthorn try to get to the bottom of what Mariko is thinking and what the plan is. She tries to stick to her story, which of course Yabu can see through, just as Ashido and everyone else can. It probably shouldn't be, but it's still fun watching his meltdown. And after he leaves, Blackthorn starts to get it. Not in the sense that he can get behind pushing the issue and forcing Ishido to stop her. She tells him the reason for that. It's to get Ishido to admit he's holding everyone hostage. The engine likens that to walking into a sword just to prove the blade is sharp. But after she begs him not to get involved for the sake of all they've been through, he does get that. Her son, who we met as a true mama's boy, picks a pretty bad time to start rebelling against her. He comes in and informs her that he's to be married to Kiyama's granddaughter and asks her to fall in line because he's tired of the shame that surrounds their family. It's just a bit extra that she has to deal with since there's no way she can stop now and no way for him to know how he's being used by Kiyama and the other regents. After that, we get the best scene of the series so far. She assembles her samurai, loads up the wives, and then attempts to leave the city. The guards are under order to make sure that doesn't happen. Ishido has instituted a new rule requiring anyone who wants to leave to obtain a permit from the regents. And after the conversation reaches an impasse, she orders her men to kill the guards. By the time we get there, a number of important people have gathered above the wall to watch it all unfold. Blackthorn and Yabashige, Kiyama and Ono, and even Ochiba are all there. Her men fight bravely and treat it like it's an honor, 
Once they're all cut down, she tries to continue walking while warning arrows mark each step and then tries to fight her way out by using her Naganata spear. She fights like hell, but there are way too many of them. Her screams intensify as her frustration meets the immovable truth of the situation, and she collapses to the ground and has to give up. She apologizes, saying it's not possible to fight through all these men, and announces that they prevented her from following an order from her liege lord. Because she can't have that offense, she will take her life at sunset. She calls on Kiyama as a fellow Christian to be her second. And again, we have Ochiba and Blackthorn reactions to work as a mirror while we process what we just heard. I mentioned how the flashback with Alvito puts her beliefs into perspective, and this request to have Kiyama serve as her second shows how complicated the conflict between her belief systems can get. As a Catholic, committing suicide would keep you out of heaven. In that situation, having the second end your life could be a way to resolve that. I also already touched on Ochiba setting them straight that she'd do it anyway, just to be free of the disgrace that she's been burdened with ever since her father killed his lord. When Ishido asks her for counsel, she turns up her very sweet, don't mind me, I'm just a silly woman voice, but then lays out the situation. If they let her die, there will be a revolt from every high family in Osaka. If they let her leave, all the hostages will demand to be able to follow her. Both choices would diminish his advantage, so he's gonna have to think of a third option. Blackthorn gets a request to meet with the heir, which turns out to be a way for Ochiba to cover up the fact that she wants to talk with Mariko privately. The heir is there, but he just sort of wanders around in the background, which is kind of funny. Ochiba drops the voice and starts by telling Mariko to stop playing games. When that doesn't work, she appeals to their friendship by saying she wants her to translate for the engine. And they go through this whole thing where she pretends like she's saying it to him. Mariko never really translates. And eventually they just finally start talking to each other. Ochiba doesn't want her childhood friend to die a pointless death. At least not for Toronaga. Mariko flips it around, insisting she's the one who could stop this, which there is some truth to that. She could stop it from happening. And there's this great moment where a tear sneaks out of Ochiba's eye, and she immediately forces a smile, but it's all while she's turned away so no one can even see her. And then she says she doesn't have the power. She says she only exists to protect her son and wants to know how piercing her heart will protect Mariko's. While this all seems sincere, it doesn't change anything, just as the heartfelt request from Blackthorn that follows doesn't either. She uses different language to tell them the same thing. For Ochiba, they had that complicated way of communicating because of their respective positions, being on opposing sides of this conflict, and because of the way things are for women in general. She tells her that accepting death isn't surrender, and then she goes back to poetry. Flowers are only flowers because they fall. Blackthorn's argument is that she's already made her point and doesn't need to continue. And she tells him that life and death are the same. They both can have purpose. He argues that only one is permanent, which misses her point that what makes life matter is that it doesn't last forever. When she grabs his hand rather than telling him no, where they're each at makes sense, and you feel for both of them. John goes to the garden and disrupts its perfectly groomed sand by making a line with his finger. Mariko visits Alvito to confess that she's not worthy to confess. A room is prepared, and she arrives to learn that Kiyama hasn't shown up to be her second. There are a lot of rough moments in this episode for Mariko, but when she calls for him and then takes off her cross when she realizes he's not there, it has to be one of the worst. And it sets things up for it to be a complete surprise when Blackthorn steps in. You think he's going to make an ass of himself and try to stop her, but instead reveals how his time with her has changed him. Luckily, her resolve isn't as sharp as Mizuguchi's was in episode 7, because as a grown man, I'm sure the engine would have done better than a 12-year-old Toronaga, but that's a very low bar. Ishido does arrive with her permit to leave before we have to find out, and the rest of the women in the room immediately hit him up to see if they can leave too. He's forced to say yes as long as they apply for their permits, and he can barely contain his disgust as he storms out of the room. You can't really blame him either. She did force him into an impossible situation. He sets out to resolve this by calling on Yabashige, who as I mentioned at the beginning is still motivated by self-preservation. Rather than taking his head, Ishido enlists him to help a group of shinobi enter the compound so they can take Mariko hostage. 
This would allow them a level of deniability, at least as much as they've had with those bandit attacks, while avoiding having her killing herself or leaving. It may have worked out too, but she wasn't willing to be captured. Yabu is caught in the middle. Blackthorn finally gets to use his pistols, and he makes a real difference. And they make it to temporary safety in a storehouse with heavy doors. When they hear the shinobi getting ready to blow their way inside, the option to surrender and go peacefully to protect everyone else was there. Given the situation, she was truly off the hook. No one could blame her for not making it out of the city at that point. Mariko knows that they want to capture her though, and understands that if she dies, it'll wreck his plan. So she chooses to sacrifice herself by standing in front of the doors to make sure that she'll never survive. The choice makes it a beautiful death for a character who was defined by the anguish that living in disgrace caused her. In her final moments, she declared that her death was an act of protest, and it could have real meaning for the future of Japan. And if that would turn out to be the case, you wouldn't be able to call it a pointless death. I suppose that all depends on what happens next week, because the episode ends with her. Another great episode, and we've just got one more to go. On the official podcast, they mentioned that the line, flowers are only flowers because they fall, is from a poem the real-life person that Mariko is based on wrote. I couldn't find the whole thing, but thought that was an interesting detail. I've seen some book readers who were critical of the show because they missed the love affair between Blackthorn and Mariko. And I don't know, I thought all their scenes were so charged in this episode in a way that felt real. And you do see how they affected each other. Oh, and the scene where he comes to her on her last night, that was up there with the Willow World scene. I guess I should clarify that this isn't what Tornaga was talking about when he proposed Crimson Sky to his vassals. It wasn't some secret plan all along. This is where he ended up based on what was going on. The original plan was supposed to be a full-on assault with his armies. In the end, Mariko fulfilled her purpose and certainly went there willing to sacrifice her life if necessary. But I like that even though it happened quickly, she was able to assess the situation and go out on her own terms. Usually when you start throwing that phrase around, it's because someone deserved to die but you still kind of like them as a character. And in their end, they managed to have a good death. This is an end, but this is something different, and I think that's a great place to leave things. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.